I wanted to begin by just saying some standard words about geometric group theory. So what geometric group theory is about is we want to study groups uh, by studying spaces on which they act as a group of uh, uh, symmetry. So you want, the idea is you want to study a group G by finding space, by finding nice spaces on which uh, G acts as a group of symmetries. So people have been writing actions, G acts on X just that way now. Trying to get used to that. Um, and what the first thing you usually say is the first example, it, we either want X to be a topological space or sometimes a, a metric space. Um, maybe the first example of how to do this is, is a so called Cayley graph. So if you have a group and you have a a subset of it, which I'll think of as usually will be a set of generators, then you can form a graph called the Cayley graph of GS in the following way. You say the vertex set, the set of vertices, is just equal to G. So G groups are always going to be discrete. And um, you connect two of them by an edge if they differ by multiplication on the right by an element of S. So in other words, so for example here you have the identity, and maybe you have S here, T here, and someplace else you have G, and you're going to connect that by an edge between G and GS. And maybe G and GT. So, <clears throat> so you connect them by an edge if if either um, say G and G prime are connected are connected by an edge if G prime is equal to G times S, or vice versa. And you also usually you can put arrows on these edges, showing usually going in that direction. Um, and then the basic fact is you could do this for any uh, subset, but the basic fact is that you can tell whether G is uh, generated by S is the same thing as saying, so uh, G is generated by S if and only if um, the graph is connected this graph I've just described is connected. And I also see that the group acts on this space by just multiplying on the left and it's a nice, it acts freely and transitively on the vertices. So this is the first example. And then what we usually try to do is to um, is to make the space nicer is to add two-dimensional disk or add two cells. So next we try to add uh, two cells to make, to get, a, to, to get an X which is simply connected. And um, the advantage of uh, you, you can always do that in some fashion. Um, one advantage of it is that uh, if you also make the group act freely, if G acts freely, meaning that no element fixes a point, no element other than the identity uh, fixes a point, any point, so it means that G acts equals X implies G is the identity, that's what freely means, uh, then and X is a CW complex or something, then uh, pi 1 of 
x minus g is equal to g. So in some sense, you, you see the, the group occurring as the fundamental group of a space. That's the situation we like. And then once you see that, um, you see what you want to do to get something well defined is to add cells to end up with a space with no homotopy groups, in other words, with a contractible space. So eventually, you want um, X, which is uh, with no homotopy groups, which in the, if it's a CW complex, a cell complex, means it's contractible. And then again, if G acts freely, which we won't always assume, if, G, if the G action is free, um, then you'll have that X to X mod G is a covering space. And uh, in this case, uh, this, this quotient space is a KG1 space, an eilenberg maclean space, or it's also called the classifying space of the group. So in this case, um, um, X mod G is BG, which is uh, called the classifying space. Or it's called a, a KG1 space. Or sometimes, if I just have a space whose universal cover is contractible, I'll say that uh, X mod G is aspherical. That's just terminology. So that's what aspherical means. So what I want to do today is uh, describe some nice examples of, of groups which have really nice spaces like this which they act on and I want to just, just describe those constructions. So as we said in the title, um, well basically I want to talk about I'll just uh, right angled Artin groups which are becoming uh, more and more famous due to work of, um, of uh, well, recently, uh, Ian Agel, who I, I hear is visiting here in a week or two, has, has used uh, these to uh, basically to finish off uh, all Thurston's conjectures about three manifolds. And um, based on earlier work of uh, Danny Weiss and, and Hagland, Maybe at the end I'll say a word about that. So a right-angled Artin group is abbreviated a RAG. And I also want to talk about right-angled Coxeter groups. I'm going to define these in a minute. Which on the board, I can't pronounce this. I don't know what you're supposed to say, but it's a right-angled Coxeter group, or RACs. And there's a generalization of both of these, a common generalization, which are, is called a graph product. So I want to construct the ni a nice space. The main point today will be to construct this space X, give ex an explicit description of it, and then um, <clears throat> it'll turn out to be a very nice space, a, a cubical complex. This will turn out to be what's called a, 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 a the buzzword is a, a cat zero cubical complex. It's made out of cubes. Cat zero means that it's, well, the universal cover is cat zero. It's locally cat zero. It means that it's non positively curved. And, uh, so after I do this in the remaining lectures, I'll give some applications of this construction 
either to constructing new examples of spaces or eventually I plan to talk about when I uh, when I talk oh, so I'm going to explain in later lectures what cat zero means and one application will be a famous paper by Besvina and Brady where they use uh, this structure to prove something about subgroups of right angled art and groups and also I'll talk about some constructions of examples using these Coxeter groups so that's my plan so that was a introduction so um, so the first thing, so now I want to start with some uh, preliminary definitions or notation. So the first thing is I'm going to use gamma to just mean a graph. So this is going to be a finite simplicial graph. So a simplicial graph means that there's no loops. That uh, means that uh, there's, there's either zero or one edges between any two vertices. Okay, you don't have di simplicial means that I don't allow two vertices connected like that or one vertex connected like that. Those are no good. And usually finite means there's a finite number of vertices. Usually I'll just take the vertex set of, of this to be I'll write it the set n which will just mean a set with n vertices, with n elements. And then the edge, the edge set will be certain pairs of those. Um, now, uh, another thing that's going to be very important for us, which I'll probably have to say several times, is I'm going to talk about something called, uh, a, there's an associated simplicial complex meaning it's, it's made out of uh, which I'll call uh, L of gamma and I call this the associated flag complex other people call it the uh, combinatorialists call it the click complex And what it is, is it's, uh, it ha its vertex set is the same as gamma. Its edge set is the same as the, uh, its edges are the same as the edges in gamma. And then you fill in a simplex for every complete subgraph, okay? So a simplex, there's one simplex of L of gamma, the, 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 simpl the simplices of L of gamma you should say it like this, of L of gamma are, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the complete subgraphs. This, we'll need to know what th this is. So, but, is that this clear what it, so in other words, you might have, I don't know, um, gamma might look something like this. And maybe you'd have something over here. Just <clears throat> and so this says <sighs> every time you see a complete subgraph, you fill in a simplex. So for these three triangles, we, we, we fill in that, that triangle. We fill in the triangles, the faces of the tetrahedron, and then we fill in the tetrahedron. That's a, sim a, tetra a simplex means a generalized triangle. So you, you, in other words, you look at your graph and you fill in all possible simplices. Is that clear what that means? Okay. Now, uh, the next thing that comes up is the idea of, so I'll just give the general definition and then specialize it in a second. So the general definition is suppose I have a, a sequence of groups, maybe I call it G, I'll just say G1, to Gn, a sequence of discrete groups. And then I want to define their graph product, which I'll denote by uh, 
with respect to gamma. And actually, sometimes I'm going to end up, later I'm going to get confused and end up calling this G, L, G sub L, instead of, or G sub L of gamma, something like that. All those things mean the same thing. So this is the graph product. So the definition is, you take the free product of these G sub I's, and then you divide by the normal subgroup, where the nor N is the normal subgroup generated by all commutators. So let's see if I can write this down. So you look at the set of all commutators, G, I, G, J, uh, where G, I is in G, I, G, J is in G, J, and uh, I, J is an edge. And then you uh, look at the normal subgroup they generate. Or in other words, we just take the free product of these groups and we impose the relation that two copies commute whenever the I and J are connected by an edge. Okay? So just sometimes they commute, sometimes they don't, just depending what the edges are. So in other words, so this is what N is. So in other words, this... Um, so for example, if uh, gamma is the complete graph, maybe I'll just write that delta, which means the complete graph, then uh, G sub gamma is just equal to the product, the ordinary product of the G sub i's. And the other example is that if if gamma has no edges, then we don't divide out by anything. So uh, G gamma is just the uh, free product. So this just means ordinary Cartesian product, and this means free product, all words. So the two basic examples of this are right-angled Artin groups and right-angled Coxeter groups. So in fact, in practice, probably, I'm always going to have, so usually, all the GIs that will be the same. The GIs will be some group. Usually, say, GIs is, is the constant sequence. And the two main examples are right angle Coxeter groups when all the GIs are the cyclic group of order two. And in which in this case, I'll use the notation. So the, this graph product of these Z2s is maybe I should put a Z2 in there. I'll call that W sub gamma and call that the right angled Coxeter group associated to gamma. So this is a group genera generated by elements of order two, and some of those generators commute and some don't. So that, that's what a right angle Coxeter group is. Example two is the right angled Artin groups. That just means all the GIs are equal to Z. And so in that case, I'll use the, no I'll use the notation G gamma equals A gamma, which is the right angled Art in the group. Two A's in there. So that's all a right angled art and group is. So in particular, when you have the complete graph, it just gives you a free abelian group. And when you have a graph with no edges, it gives you a free group. Interpolates between those two things. So I think now I can construct the space, the main, so basically what I plan to do now is just ba do the same construction three times in a row. Hope that by repeating something three times is one way to explain things. <laughs> it might be a little boring. <clears throat> but I'm gonna explain it in the Artin group case, the Coxeter group case, 
and in the general case. So, um, so let me start with uh, art and groups. I guess you call this a number. Okay, let's just start with art and groups. And I'm going to uh, construct a space, a, a contractible space. Um, so first of all, I'm going to construct uh, the quotient space of the, of the group, which I'll call, so I'm going to construct a space which I'm going to call X gamma, which people have been calling, it's probably partly my fault for calling it this, the Salvetti complex. I think it was considered earlier, but there's a, a similar thing for non-right angled art and groups called the Salvetti complex. And so the definition of this is it's going to be a subcomplex. So X sub gamma is going to be a subcomplex of the torus, which just means the product of n copies of S1. So what is it's a certain subcomplex of this. Uh, and what is it? So I'll just write the, the general definition and then think about it for a second. So I'm going to write uh, if, uh, if I have any subset of vertices, I'm going to use the notation of, of 1 through n. I'm going to use the notation, um, should I call it x? Or? So I'm just going to define, a, I'll just call it a x upper i. And this is supposed to be the set of points of, of points x in the torus, so that the uh, <clears throat> if I have any coordinate which doesn't lie in this subset, it has to be the base some base point. So it says so that x j say is equal to one for all j which aren't in this subset. I'm just trying to write down the definition and then we'll draw some pictures and see what it is. <clears throat> okay, so and now so now remember I have this graph and I, if I, and I have this flag complex and I can talk about a simplex in the flag complex. And just to be pedantic, I'm going to use I of sigma to mean the, the set of vertices of that thing. So that's a, a subset of N. And then here's the definition. It's that uh, this thing we call X gamma is the following subset of the torus. It's the union of all these things I called X I of sigma where sigma ranges over all simplices in this flag complex, including the empty set. There's one, there's a point which is the base point here too. So let me just draw a picture, say, see, see what we're talking about here. So it's hard to draw these a torus in more than two dimensions. But I have colored chalk here. Yeah. Okay. So here's here's my. Let's see if I can draw a torus. So maybe the first picture is I have an n torus where n is the number of vertices. And maybe the first picture is, uh, what do I do if, say, gamma is just two points? In which case, I'd have a two torus. And I'd, in that case, this definition says, well, I have one point which actually corresponds to the empty set here. And then for each vertex, I have one of these uh, standard circles. Okay, so this is 
this is the points where say x2 is equal to 0 and this is the or x2 is equal to 1 and this is where x1 is equal to 1 so if if I just had a graph with two points I get this picture with just two circles which is a free group now if I had something where um, gamma is a interval then I fill in uh, I fill in the two torus so for this case I fill in uh, I fill in a two-dimensional torus for all ij such that ij is an edge in the graph. And then if I had a three-dimensional torus, I would go ahead and if I had three things, maybe I'll I'm gonna maybe I should draw that picture now. If I had three things, I go ahead and I fill in uh, a two torus for each edge, and then I fill in a three-dimensional three cell or a three-dimensional cube uh, for each uh, for each two simplex in 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 my L of gamma for each triangle, and then I just continue like that. So, actually, I'm, I'm going to draw this picture again. I think. So one way to think of the torus is, say if I had a three torus, I take the usual picture of a torus where I take a cube, an n-dimensional cube, and I identify opposite faces. So this is a, the, the, so the n-torus is the cube with opposite faces identified. And now suppose, so here's a, a good, what would I take if I took, say I have three, three points, one, two, and three, and say I connect one and two by an edge and I don't connect three, okay? Then the, there's no triangles to fill in. So in that case, in that case, the complex I would be getting would be I would have a two torus, say this is, Direction one, this is direction. So, so first of all, the fact that I have three vertices means that I always put in the all three circles, which means the whole one skeleton of this cube. So I'm going to end up with that. This is the top is identified with the bottom, and then I'm going to end up with the vertical edges. And then, I, so I identify that. I'm going to end up with something in this case, which is topologically, I can't, inside the three torus, it's going to look like a torus wedge a circle. Now the theorem is, which I think I can prove, I think I will prove. The theorem is that the fundamental group of this so there's the first part is that the fundamental group of this complex X is in fact uh, so the space is going to be the universal cover of X um, so the fundamental group is this right angled Artin group and the universal cover which I'll denote by x gamma tilde is contractible. In other words, x gamma is this classifying space for the right angled Artin group. Couldn't be simpler. And uh, <coughs> so the, the, the proof of the first statement is, in fact, this is just uh, more or less the st so uh, the first statement is that is that if we look at just the two-dimensional cells of X gamma, what we get by just putting in the uh, circles and the squares, the circles and the two torus, this is exactly the um, more or less the standard way that you build. A complex whose fundamental group is a gamma. So this is the 
the standard presentation complex. for A gamma. Namely, we take one generator uh, for each vertex in the graph and then by filling in this two torus you make those generators commute exactly when they're connected by an edge. So in fact, this is, if you've seen how to construct a, a two complex whose fundamental group is, is a group with generators and relations, this is it. For in this special case of a right angled Artin group. So it's, it's, it's obvious that pi 1 of x is equal to uh, a gamma. Now, in general, this thing won't be aspherical. Its universal cover won't be um, contractible. Um, but let me indicate how you, one way, there, and I, I'm, eventually I'm going to give another proof of why it's contractible. I'm going to prove that the universal cover is cat zero. But actually there's a simple proof based on the uh, following uh, lemma due to Whitehead. And this what, lemma is, is a way to test when, if you glue together two spaces, well, if you glue together two k pi 1 spaces, when is the result a k pi 1? So in other words, the situation I'm going to say is I have a space B, which is the union of two spaces and their intersection is B naught. So it's an interval of spaces. Everything is going to be connected. And I'm also going to assume that, say, GI is the fundamental group of BI. So I'm assuming, and uh, and I'm going to assume that uh, that G naught injects into either of these pieces. That the inclusion of B naught into B B one or B two is an injection. And I'm finally, I'm going to assume that uh, bi is a k pi 1 space. Then the conclusion is that b is a k pi 1 space. Then b is, in fact, bg, where um, g is the amalgamated free product of those two things. Well, basically, this is Van Kampen's theorem that the fundamental group of, of a union is an amalgamated free product. And the statement here is that um, the universal, if each of these pieces has a contractible universal cover, then the whole thing has contractible universal cover. And so the proof of this is actually just think about it for a second. So we want to say, so we want to prove, uh, we want to prove that the universal cover of B is contractible, and the, the picture is, is this, is this proof, you, you, you take, you think about <laughs> B is a union of these pieces, you think about what the inverse image of each of these pieces is in the universal cover. So some pieces will be universal covers of B1. Other pieces will be universal covers of B2. There might be another B2 tilde over here. And then the B1s. And then, and then you look at the, at the lifts of the B0. So that's going to be a contractible they're going to intersect, which I'll just draw like this. So according to different cosets of uh, which, well, there, there'll be different copies of this B0 going from a copy of B1 to a copy of B2. And you'll get some picture like this. And then the proof is, that picture, if you think about it, it looks like a tree. 
Okay. So you just collapse, collapse each B0, B1 tilde and B2 tilde to a vertex and uh, B0 tilde, the B0 tildes to, ed to edges. And the result has got to be a tree. So once you do that collapse, you have to get a tree, because if you didn't have a tree, you'd have a circuit in there, and that circuit would contradict the fact that this universal cover was simply connected. And in fact, it's the bass air tree. It's a, it's a tree associated with this decomposition. Now, how do you finish this? Uh, okay, I'm probably going to run out of time. How do I finish the proof of this theorem? So here's one proof of it. How do I prove that this... So now I want a proof of the theorem. I want to show that this uh, x2 tilde gamma is contractible. Or in other words, I want to show that x gamma is uh, BA gamma. So the proof, the proof is going to be by induction on the number of vertices. And the base case is really, you first you do the following special case. You do the, the special case where gamma is the complete graph. So you say gamma is equal to um, gamma is equal to the complete graph. In other words, L of gamma is a whole simplex. So this means the complete graph. And in that case, the L of gamma is the whole simplex spanned by those vertices, and you get that X gamma is just the torus. And it's true for that. Okay? The torus. The universal cover of the torus is, R, is Euclidean space, and that's contractible. Maybe I should leave this for a minute. And then the, the general case And the other case is that if, if gamma is not a complete graph, if it's not a complete graph, that means there's two vertices which aren't connected by an edge. By an edge. So that implies there exists vertices i, j in N so that i, j is not an edge. So you have two, ver two points that aren't connected by an edge, and then what you can do is you can use that to decompose gamma. You can write, say, gamma sub i means the, the full graph, means the full graph spanned by gamma minus i, gamma sub j equals the full graph spanned by gamma minus j, and gamma sub i j is their intersection. which is the gr full graph spanned by the complement of those two things. <clears throat> and now we use Whitehead. And, and, so now, and now we're in the, it's easy to see we're in the situation we can apply Whitehead's theorem. So we have, and we have uh, x gamma is equal to x gamma i union x gamma, x gamma, uh, I guess x gamma i j, x gamma j, and by induction each of these pieces is aspherical, and so by Whitehead's lemma, uh, x gamma is aspherical. So you just get the, so Whitehead's lemma implies the result.
the X gamma is eight is is right. Okay. So now I want to run. Okay, took too much time on that, but now I want to go to the case of right angle coxeter groups, which is a similar description. You see, I'm not going to get to any applications today. Maybe you're lucky to get to the graph products. So now I want to talk about right angled coxeter groups and I want to say a very similar discussion and I'm going to call this, eventually I'm going to put more letters in here, but I'm going to call this Z gamma or sometimes I'll call it or Z L gamma or for any simplicial complex just Z L. So this is the I define it exactly the same way, almost exactly the same way. I, uh, so now this Z gamma is going to be a subcomplex, not of a torus, but just of a cube. It's going to sit inside a cube. And just as I did before, I'm going to let, say, Z upper I be the set of points X in this cube such that. Um, the i-th coordinate is, uh, well now it's, it's either plus or minus one. So I'll say the i-th coordinate is, is either plus or minus one whenever, or the j-th coordinate, whenever j is not in that subset i. So whenever I'm not in the subset i, I require that the coordinate has to be either plus one or minus one. Otherwise it's, it's in between. <coughs> And then I define, just as I did before, I'm going to define Z gamma to be the union of the Z upper I of sigmas, where sigma ranges over the flag complex. So now this is actually a better, the picture here, this is the, actually the, the correct picture for, uh, for Z gamma. So if gamma is this at one interval and one point, then this is supposed to be Z gamma. So in other words, what I do is, So I have uh, three vertices. So each of three vertices in my graph, each of those means that um, I look at the points where the other coordinates are, are all plus or minus one. If I think about that, say, in the, in the three direction, I get the three vertical lines. And uh, then I either get the, or the four vertical lines. And so I get, I get the, uh, what, just looking at the, if I just had three vertices here, I would just get the one skeleton of the cube. If this is my graph, then for one, two, I fill in, uh, I have, you know, Z upper one, two, means I look at all the places where the third coordinate is plus or minus one, that just means the top and the bottom face, okay? So this is, I get exactly something like that. Let me just make the remark, which I'll, maybe I shouldn't make this remark. So one, okay, I'll remark that one property of this is that uh, the link of any vertex is canonically identified with L, or L of gamma. So in other words, the link of a vertex means, I take one of these vertices like this, this vertex, and the link means I look at the intersection of a small sphere uh, around that vertex. And so what I get is, uh, 
in this case the picture of this edge and disjoint union one point. So the link, the link of a vertex, this means link, the link of a vertex means basically the set of two cells, or the set of cells as a as a abstract simplicial complex, it's, it's a set of cells which contain this vertex. And then, uh, and then basically, the link of a vertex in a cube is a one lower dimensional simplex. So you just fill in a simplex of one less dimension for each uh, cell. That's what this is. A, abstract partially ordered set. But they're all the same. So in, and so, in fact, maybe I'll just make one more remark. So, if uh, L of gamma happens to be, say, a sphere, an M minus one sphere, it's a, it's, a, it's a triangulation of some sphere, it's homeomorphic to that, then uh, this space Z of gamma, it locally looks like the cone over a sphere, which means it locally is, uh, looks like Euclidean space, which means it's an M manifold. So Z of gamma is locally isomorphic or homeomorphic to the cone on a sphere, which implies that Z gamma is a closed manifold. So this is one reason these Coxeter groups are better well, I haven't said why it's a Coxeter group, but this complex gives me a way to construct a closed manifold, basically whose link of a vertex is anything I like. And if I make it a sphere, then I get a manifold. Now, what, why is this called Coxeter groups? Okay, so I, I want to say how you cook out uh, a right angle Coxeter group out of this situation. Well, the, the thing that we do is we, we look at the cyclic group to the n acts on the cube as a group generated by reflections, as where the i th z2 just acts by sending xi to minus xi uh, as, uh, by reflections. In other words, if I start with a square, then I have uh, one reflection is reflection around one coordinate hyperplane, and the other reflection is, is reflection like that. And now what is this W gamma going to be? So, um, so I'm going to look at Z gamma is the universal cover of Z gamma. And I'm going to look at all lifts of this Z2 to the N action to the universal cover. That, in fact, is going to be the Coxeter group. But I'll just, go for, just to state the theorem, I'll call that G for a minute. So G will be the group of all lifts of, oh, so I should have said, Z2 to the N acts on this, and I should have said, and Z gamma is mapped to itself by this action is stable under this action. Just because the way I defined it, I didn't distinguish between plus and minus one. <clears throat> so Z2 to the N acts on Z gamma, and I'm going to look at the group of all lifts of the Z2 to the N action to the universal cover. And the claim is two parts. The claim is that that's uh, why is it a group? Because if I if I have one lift covers one element of z two to the n, and another group thing covers a, another element of z two to the n, then their product then their composition covers the composition downstairs.
you, you can do this. Th th that's nothing special to this. The group of you can always look at the group of lifts of anything to a universal the set of all lifts of anything to the universal cover is a group. <clears throat> so the theorem is, first of all, that this G is the right angle coxeter group associated to gamma. And the second thing is, is that um, is that this space is contractible. It's not exactly saying that it's that Z gamma is a K pi one because G doesn't act freely on here. Okay. If I if I take the uh, at least if I take the lift of an involution and it fixes a base point, the, the lift will also be an involution, fixing some lift of the base point. Okay, so let me, so in fact, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to say much about how we prove two today, but um, let me just say what's the proof of one? Maybe I should draw a picture to go with this picture. So, what? Just to see what's going on. If I, if I look at the universal cover of, of that cube with the top and bottom filled in, I'll get something that looks like this. I'll get something made out of squares and edges. And basically. <clears throat> If I take, you know, the lift of some vertex like this vertex, maybe lifts up to this vertex, and then I look at the, um, I'll have one reflection that is a reflection like that, another reflection which is a reflection like that, and another third reflection which is a reflection like that. So those are the lifts of. Uh, three reflections, the lifts which, which take this base point to itself, where, where that's that. So, so the statement is that that space is contractible and that Z gamma tilde is in fact this right angle coxeter group. So the proof is, is more or less just looking at that picture. So the proof of one is first of all, I have that Z2 to the N acts freely and transitively on the vertices of the cube, okay? So, so the fact that Z mod 2 to the N acts freely and transitively on the vertices of the cube Says that this says that this group G I've defined acts freely and transitively on on the vertices of uh, Z gamma on vertices of Z gamma tilde. That basically says that that if I just look at the one skeleton which I have drawn here. If I look at the, at the vertices and the edges, it is the Cayley graph of some group, okay? If I, I, the, I have a group which acts, which can be identified with the vertices, and I put in an edge when they differ by a generator. So in other words, this says that the G, the, this says the one skeleton of this is the Cayley graph of some group. Of G. So that you can think whatever G is, you can think of its one of a, the one of its Cayley graph as being the one skeleton of this. Now, what else do I have? Well, I filled in squares 
whenever I and J are supposed to commute. In other words, uh, so I, I, if, if, you know, if I have an SI, SJ, this is SI, and this is SJ, whenever I have two of these generators commute with each other, I filled in a square. And I've ended up with something simply connected, because this is the two skeleton of my contractible space. So this is simply connected. So now I just use the fact that Z gamma tilde, the two skeleton of it, is simply connected. And that says whenever I'm in that situation, from a two-dimensional complex, I can read off the presentation. This implies that we can read off the relations other than that every edge has ordered is an involution. We can read off the relations from uh, the two cells. And the relations that you see at each vertex is just that SI and SJ commute. So, so in other words, this is, in other words, I'm saying that more or less the two skeleton of this is more or less the standard presentation complex for a right angle coxeter group. It's not, depends on your definition, but basically it says this Z2 gamma tilde is the presentation complex for Now I think it's true, oh man. Okay, at least one part, maybe I'll just wave my hands and I'll have to do it next time, but. Um, I think you can prove that it's, it's contractible, that the universal cover is contractible along the same lines as I, get, as I proved the, for the Artin group. It's a little bit different because the intersection of pieces isn't connected. It's not really, it doesn't correspond to an interval of, sp of, of spaces. And in fact, that's not the way I originally proved it. And uh, I don't think it's ever been written down that way. But I, but I think you, you, you can modify the earlier proof to show this. But I'll, I'll give a different proof later. Uh, maybe in the, I'm out of time, but maybe I'll just say this and then I'll start it with this next time. Is that what do you do for general graph products? Is you, you do the... Okay, so let me just say what the common generalization of this is, and then I'll leave that. So there's a common generalization of this called the polyhedral product. And so here, you're given a set of pairs of spaces. You're given a, a, a sequence of pairs of spaces. And I'm going to define something called, uh, say, Z gamma or Z L of gamma of A B. And it's going to be a subset of the product of the A's. So this is, I meant to get through all this today, but I'll just say the definition and then we can repeat it. And the way you define it is you define Z upper I, say of AB, exactly the same way. It's the set of all points X such that XI lies in the second space whenever I is not in I. That's exactly the same definition I gave before. And finally, that um, that um, the Z L of gamma of A B is the union of these Z upper eyes.
And then we're going to and then we're going to see just to give a what I should have done is the the two special cases we were talking about before were the first one was the case where ai bi was a circle comma a point and the second case was uh, ai bi was an interval comma the boundary of the interval so in fact it turns out that everything I said goes through if say AI is a is you can this is a this is the classifying space for Z this is B this is the classifying space for the infinite cyclic group so the same thing works if AI is any classifying space and BI is a base point and a similar picture also works for instead of taking uh, so this basically looks like the cone over the cyclic group of order 2, comma, the boundary. Well, you can take the cone over any group, comma, the boundary. And everything goes through. So, so it turns out next time I'm also going to repeat what I did this time, at the, hopefully just in the first five minutes. Okay, well, let's thanks.